Before I get started, I want to tell you what I mean by degrowth. I think what uh, most of us who are engaged in this have some variation on this theme. Degrowth is a controlled or planned contraction of human economic activity uh, toward a sustainable, equitable, steady state within the means of nature. So it represents a level of economic activity uh, that is compatible with the productive capacity of the ecosystems upon which we are dependent. Our culture has forgotten that the human economy is a subsystem of the natural system called the ecosphere. Every act of economic production is actually in and hamburgers and using energy in the process, not to mention the beef and the bread and so on and so forth, or trading stocks in New York or Toronto. Every act of economic activity involves the consumption of energy, which is permanent and irreversible, in the sense that energy is constantly being degraded and radiated off the planet through use. And every activity involves the throughput of some material, and I mean every activity. And that material throughput, although it theoretically is recyclable, most of it isn't recycled. So we have a situation in which one species on the planet like all others, is part of the larger whole called the ecosystem. But our species has the myth of perpetual growth and technology to aid and abet that myth. And what it has meant is that the scale of the human enterprise has far exceeded in its consumptive capacity the ability of the ecosystems that sustain us to regenerate themselves. So if you think about it, Every major fish stock on the planet is in a state of decline. Agricultural soils, we treat in our culture the same way we do a, a mine. We don't husband our soils, we mine them. So that if you look back to the turn of the 19th century, uh, Winnipeg, not Winnipeg, well, southern Manitoba, Saskatchewan, had the richest Chernozem soils on the planet. But in just over 100 years, of industrial agriculture, we have consumed and dissipated over half of the organic material and natural nutrients that required some 10,000 years of post-glacial soils building process to accumulate. In most of the world's major agricultural areas where they are dependent on groundwater, the groundwater tables are falling much more rapidly than they can be regenerated. So in parts of India and China and the United States, the Ogahala Reservoir, which produces so much of the food upon which we are depending, these water tables are falling meters per year. And in some places, uh, the drills can't keep up so that agricultural land is going out of production. I could go on and on and on. And it's not just about consumption overwhelming the replacement and reproductive capacity of nature. We're overfilling waste sinks as well. How many of you heard of, of uh, climate change? <laughs> okay. Climate change is a waste management problem. Okay. Climate change is a waste management problem in the proximate sense. Because it's primarily driven uh, at, the, at this point, although there's other gases catching up, by carbon dioxide, which results from the burning of the energy I talked about earlier, which is part of every kind of economic activity. Now, carbon dioxide, most people weren't even aware that it was a waste until about four or five years ago, but it always has been. Carbon dioxide, listen, is the single largest waste by weight in every industrial economy. So we can think all we like of the waste, you know, that we dispose of in our kitchens and bathrooms and through the garbage system and so on and so forth. Trivial compared to the sheer mass of carbon dioxide. And it stands to reason because one of the largest inputs to the industrial economy is carbon-based fuel, coal, oil, natural gas. And in the burning of those things, the uh, carbon is converted to carbon dioxide, which goes into the atmosphere. We don't see it the same way we do when we take out a pail of garbage, but the sheer volume of carbon dioxide exceeds any other waste product produced in industrial economies. It's driving climate change. It therefore is an example of a waste sink overflowing. The whole of the ecosphere 
is no longer cap capable of assimilating the total loss of carbon dioxide or, or production of carbon dioxide. Normally, it's taken up by photosynthesis, and in a, a system that is compatible with nature, the rate of production of carbon dioxide by living systems is exactly balanced by the rate of assimilation by photosynthesis in green plants, and it is recycled uh, through the process. But a rogue species has come along that is using carbon-based fuels, which were laid down by photosynthesis tens of millions of years ago, much more rapidly than the contemporary ecosphere can reabsorb those, that carbon and deposit it in soil, uh, and so on and so forth. So the point then that I want to make is that we are a rogue species that have broken from the natural negative feedbacks that would normally keep a species in check by virtue of our high intelligence and our ability to manipulate materials and energy to very narrow human purposes. And this has become hugely problematic. So tonight we're here to talk about the idea of why degrowth. I've already defined it, and again, I want you to get this clear. Degrowth is the purposeful contraction of the economy in a controlled manner until it is a sustainable steady state in which there is a more or less equitable distribution of the products of the economy. It doesn't have to be completely equal, but we should not have on this planet a billion people in poverty and another billion suffering from obesity. There's a clear imbalance there. So we need equity within the means of nature. And we're still at the point where it's just marginally possible. So that's the goal of the degrowth uh, rhetoric, as it were. Why, <clears throat> pardon me, why degrowth? Because it's a hell of a lot better than the alternative. And that's what uh, I want to talk about tonight. Okay. First of all, here's the context. I've already implied that there's something special about the human species. And it's our capacity as a, as a species that has I'm going to say four really unique qualities. It's okay, you can sit there if you like. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. So four unique qualities. There's, there's several, but I think the important ones are high intelligence. And by high intelligence, I mean the capacity to reason from the evidence. Okay? It's the capacity to reason logically based on what we know. Another quality of human beings is the capacity to plan ahead. No other species on Earth has the capacities associated with high intelligence or the ability to plan ahead, to use the product of reasoning to change the future. Okay. We also have the capacity uh, to be moral beings, to distinguish right from wrong. I assert it is wrong in a planet of plenty for a billion people to be constantly plagued by the disease and ill nourishment of poverty when there's another billion people who are excessively endowed with wealth and capital and all the rest of it. That's a moral judgment call, but no other species can make it. We also have other uh, qualities that we share with other species, but uniquely uh, available to us in, in, in intensity, and that's empathy and sympathy for other species and other people, should we choose to exercise them. Now, I raise these four qualities because I want you to think about which of them do you see in evidence in, for example, British Columbia's current economic development policy based on the exploitation of fossil fuels and exports into world markets? Which of these qualities do you see exercised by our federal government in Ottawa as it shuts down our research libraries and muzzles our scientists and essentially uh, keeps uh, the Canadian public in ignorance of our own a scientific knowledge about the state of the economy, the state of the nation, and so on and so forth. So we have a real problem here of, of cognitive dissonance. Uh, uh, we're going in a place in our minds which is remote from the, the, the real world. Well, one of the ways we've used intelligence is in the application of technology to grow the economy. And we've been remarkably successful. These are simply graphs to show the exponential explosion of just about everything uh, to do with human beings uh, since the 1700s, okay? Particularly since about the middle part of the 19th century. That's when we got into fossil fuels in a big way. And I want to make the point that fossil fuels are really the basis for the entire explosion of human numbers. 
the entire explosion of all the artifacts associated with human activity. Fossil fuel is the means by which we acquire all other resources needed to grow the human enterprise. We've gone in just 150 years from a point in which 100% of the caloric content of a plate of food was solar energy harvested through animal and human labor, which was really secondary solar energy, to the point where now 90 out of 100 calories on your plate is a product of fossil fuel, fertilizers, pesticides, irrigation, and so on and so forth. So this dependence is complete. This building is a product of fossil fuel. Modern cities are impossible in the absence of fossil fuel. And all of the artifacts associated with urban life, as illustrated by the previous slide, are the result of fossil fuel. We are now, however, in a state of overshoot. I emphasize this in my introductory remarks. We've reached the point where, by many measures, we are using the Earth at about 50% faster than it can regenerate. 50% faster than the Earth regenerates. Now, even a school kid will ask, how can that be? How can we use something faster than it's regenerating? And the answer is because there were enormous stocks of so-called natural capital assets that had accumulated uh, through uh, geological time on this planet. Coal, oil, natural gas, in an incredible abundance, but accumulated over tens of millions of years, tens of millions of years ago. Soils, I mentioned the prairie soils, those massive deposits of chernozemic soils that took 10 or 11,000 years to generate, which we've depleted by 50 to 70% in just a century and a half or so by now, and so on. So we start with enormous stocks and we deplete them. We literally convert the substance of ecosystems into our own bodies and to uh, the artifacts of our culture. So we're in a world of overshoot, but we're in denial about this. Most people wouldn't attend a talk like this because the concept of degrowth is so hostile to our embedded imagery of the necessity of growth. And even that's a paradox. Because if you look at those curves, they show 150 or 200 years of human history during which there's been explosive growth. But what about the previous 200,000 years of history in which there was no growth? Or at least the, the best we could say was that the growth of human population was represented by the spreading of our species over the surface of the earth. That took about a 50,000 year period. But within any particular habitat, human populations fluctuate with the carrying capacity of the environment. Good years produce lots of food, lots of babies born, bad years, mortality increases, and the population fluctuates at or near human carrying capacity. What we've done is eliminate the negatives disease, shortages of food, shortage of resources. We conquer you know, the climate uh, in a local environments, enabling much greater survival. And so our numbers increase. But of course, as our numbers increase, we demand more and more materials. And as incomes go up per capita and absolute consumption of the system goes up, and we wind up in this kind of overshoot situation. This is what it looks like. I, um, so somebody mentioned, I guess, Justin, was it? No ecological footprint analysis. The technique that we've developed at, at UBC, uh, my students and I over some couple of decades actually, and still ongoing, is a simple notion that we can look at any uh, person or any nation's flows of energy and material and follow that back through the production cycle to land and water ecosystems. So if you think of yourselves you are probably wearing a cotton, this happens to be wool, these are cotton pants. Uh, we're sta I'm standing on a wooden stage. You're sitting on chairs made out of petroleum byproducts and so on and so forth. There's nothing in the room, including your bodies, that can't be traced back uh, through the economic production cycle to an ecosystem somewhere. So it occurred to me way back in the 70s that if I could measure the amount of the ecosystem area required to sustain just me, I'd have an idea of what I now call my personal ecological footprint. See, how many of you have lain awake at night? I used to do this, staring at the ceiling of your bedroom, trying to fall asleep, wondering just how much of the Earth's surface is dedicated to supporting just me in the style to which I am accustomed. Well, not many of us do because it just seems to flow to us automatically. But the reality is 
despite our technological wizardry and the illusion of increasing independence of nature, we're more dependent now than ever on nature by the measure of the ecological footprint. It takes anywhere between four and seven or even 10 global average hectares to sustain one person in the average industrial country. Europeans, four to five, six hectares per capita. North Americans, six, seven, eight hectares per capita. Hectare, by the way, is 2.47 acres. It's a hell of a lot of territory needed to produce the food and fiber that we consume and to assimilate just our carbon wastes. So each of us is still, we've never been born. You know, you're attached to your maternal mother by an umbilical cord and there's a placenta and the placenta is an organ by which you exchange food and wastes between the infant in, in the womb and the mother, okay? Well, you are part of Mother Earth and the economy is our placentum. It, it is the means by which we suck nutrients from the planet and dump our wastes back into the planet. And the eco footprint is a measure of your personal placenta. And for most of us in this room, it's around five to seven hectares in that brain. Hell of a lot of territory. It's a hell of a lot of territory because on the planet today, there are about 13 or 14, well, it says 12, it's getting smaller, billion hectares of biophysically productive land and waterscape. Divide that by the 7.2 billion people and you come up with a number around 1.7. On Earth today, there are 1.7 hectares of biophysically productive land and waterscape per person. In the absence of energy, what goes up must come down. This is an abnormal phenomenon. The growth that we have experienced as a species in terms of population numbers and infrastructure is the single most abnormal or anomalous period in history. And yet, interestingly, if you do a survey of the mention of growth in the economics literature, it doesn't even show up until the 1950s. Growth was not a element, a platform in the political, any political parties, what am I saying? It was not a plank in the platform of any political party until well into the 1950s. So it's that recent a phenomenon in terms of a public dialogue and, and mission in the post-war period. That's when it happened. And yet we take it now to be the norm and the only way that we can go. So we have to recognize that previous cycles of human cultures have followed a pernicious pattern. Um, I'm not making this up. To, uh, refer to a book called The Collapse of Complex Societies by Joseph Tainter. Or another one, Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed. Or more simply, Ronald Wright, a local anthropologist, A Short History of Civilization. They all make the same point, that unconscious societies go through a cycle of uh, increasing complification, uh, leading to rigidification, non-response to data. What, what's that? Hi, Conrad. Hi. Ten, ten fingers. Yeah, ten fingers. You're not, you're not telling me ten minutes already, are you? This is the introduction, folks. Aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, Joseph Tainter. Perhaps what is most intriguing in the evolution of human societies is the regularity with which the pattern of increasing complexity is interrupted by collapse. Now, I don't have time to get into the whole theoretical foundations of his statement, but I can say that the symptoms of collapse that are identified in his book are corruption at the top, rigidity of the governance structure, increasing, diminishing returns to investment in just about everything. These are all problems plaguing the modern world uh, today. So I would argue that if we maintain the business as usual course, remember I said degrowth is better than the alternative. Business as usual is the primary alternative. Of course, there's a spectrum between these two bookends, but business as usual is taking us in one direction. Uh, rising demand, diminishing supply of energy, minerals, fish stocks, et cetera, competition for capital, unrepayable debt, and increasing costs for everything will create a situation in which economies one by one turn self following the path of Egypt, Syria, Greek, and so on and so forth. Or we can confront the possibility, if that doesn't happen, of accelerating climate change and ecological degradation, which herald a period of uneconomic growth. Here's a concept for you. We think of economic growth. What is uneconomic growth? 
It's growth in which the damage costs exceed the benefits. Now, if you've been plotting, as insurance companies do, the damage costs of extreme climate events, you'll see that it's now in the tens, regularly, tens of billions of dollars per event. And there's dozens and dozens of other uh, costs that go unmonitored by our kind of economy. We measure the benefits, not even very well, in, in, a, in a silly index called uh, GNP, but we don't measure the costs by and large. What was the cost of the collapse of the North Atlantic cod stock? Nobody bothered to really figure it out. What's the cost of the extinction of species? Well, we don't really know until the whole system goes down. But the point is, you can imagine a system in which the costs exceed the benefits, and at that point, growth is uneconomic. This is the upward tick of carbon dioxide that I mentioned earlier. We've touched uh, 400 parts uh, per million just uh, a year ago. This is the highest level that it has been for tens of millions of years. It's been a 42% increase in just this century. And the measurements are so sensitive, we can detect the breathing of the Earth, the cycle of the seasons in the Northern Hemisphere when green plants turn on and off and uh, cause that cycle to fluctuate in that manner. This is the primary driver of the uptick in, in temperature. Now you'll notice periods of, of seeming plateau or, or even a decline in temperature. That's because the oceans do a flip. There's something called the North Pacific Decadal Oscillation, for example. We happen to be in a cold water phase right now. So if you look at the top end of that thing, some will say, ah, climate change has stopped. There's, there's no warming for the last decade or so on average. By the way, uh, that's not quite true. But the point is, it's the oceans. The oceans are assimilating vast quantities of heat. And we now have a network of very sensitive instruments that can detect the rate of heat accumulation in the oceans. We're gaining, the net gain is the equivalent of a 0.6 watt light bulb on every square meter of the surface of the Earth. This is equivalent to the explosion of 400,000 Hiroshima type uh, uh, atomic bombs every day of the year, 650 or 665, 365 days uh, per year. So we're into that overshoot in just about every dimension. You all know about climate change, so I'll mention it. For the first 13 years of this century, include 12 of the warmest 14 years in the instrumental record. Extremely hot weather events have increased by a factor of 50 compared to the decades before uh, 1980. These are real numbers. This is, again, nobody's making this up. Other weather extremes are increasing in, in frequency and intensity. Recent findings, even climate scientists are beginning to panic because they're not being uh, paid attention to. I'm a scientist. I was literally took a whole course in which we were urged never to engage in politics. Your goal as a scientist is to produce data. It's not up to you to interpret the uh, social and economic meaning of those data. That is beginning to break down because the, the scientists are getting frightened with the results of their analyses. Two of the most outspoken are, are Kevin Anderson and Alice Bowes at the Tyndall Institute in the UK. Uh, they came out, uh, they've now done several papers, this one was from 2008, arguing that we are on track for over 650 parts per million equivalent of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in, in the atmosphere. That means about a 50% plus or minus uh, oper uh, chance of reaching four uh, degrees Celsius of warming, which would be absolutely catastrophic. And they argue that the only way out of this is that the OECD countries begin about a 6% per year uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions beginning immediately so that we're virtually out of carbon fuels by the, not, not out, of, out of them, but out of using them by about 2090, I guess it would be. Okay, so they argued that this really requires degrowth, a planned economic recession. That, those are their exact words. The Western world should be engaged in a planned economic recession. We've got the wealth to do it and feed and clothe everybody in the process to ease our way down, a soft landing as opposed to the crash that might uh, follow. This is just a curve showing the, the idea of uneconomic growth. As the economy grows with increasing production and consumption, the x-axis, then the marginal utility of growth, that is to say the benefits will decline over time because the next unit of 
of uh, growth isn't nearly as important as the early units, but the costs increase. And we're seeing increase in costs now every time you open a newspaper. At some point, the costs exceed or cross the, the uh, benefits. That's the optimal scale. No point in growing further because every point beyond here represents a point in which the scale of the economy produces more costs than gains. Problem. The benefits are going over here, the costs are being imposed over there, and those guys over here are the ones making the decisions. And hence, we're now in a situation where uh, the poor and impoverished are, betting, are um, <clears throat> really not in a political position to do very much about it. Even the World Bank has caught up. One of the great promoters of growth and development uh, a couple of years ago has come out with a major study. You can look it up, it's online. The projected four degree warming cannot be allowed to occur. They don't go as far as degrowth, but they believe that we're in big trouble. Despite all of these warnings, despite the World Bank report, despite, 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 this is the pattern of use of fossil fuels. It's a continuous upward trend. And we show no hesitation whatsoever in continuing in our use of fossil fuels. Just look at BC and Canada as perfect examples of economies promoting the exploitation and development of fossil fuels. The Kyoto Protocol, which was one of the great uh, signal treaties to reverse this trend, there's no obvious effect if it's ever having been implemented. Moreover, most authorities come up with curves like this when talking about the energy future. This is going out to 2030, by which point, by the way, Western countries should be down to about 50 to 70 percent reductions in fossil fuel use. But what everybody's expecting is that we will have increased continuously through that whole period. Despite everything you hear about solar and wind power making huge gains in the markets in this country or that country or, or some other place, the reality is that in the aggregate, ex excluding hydro for the time being, in the aggregate, alternative renewable energy is about 2.5% of the global energy budget, scheduled to be maybe 5 or 6% by 2030 as the fossil fuels uh, continue to increase. Hydro will play a poor, uh, about an equivalent part, so only 12% will be truly renewable energy if we stay on the business as usual track. So renewables, excluding hydro, reach 6% of market share by 2030, up from 2% a couple of years ago. So there's no hope if that's the trending uh, for uh, true alternatives. There's another reason for not being very hopeful about this, and that is the diminishing returns. Remember I said this was one of the primary signals of systemic collapse. Here are curves for the three largest oil companies on the planet, or among the three, Exxon, Royal Dutch Shell, and Chevron. The uh, orange lines show the expenditures on exploration for new deposits of oil. The fl uh, blue lines show production. So despite trillions of dollars in expenditures, production is in decline. In other words, we're not finding anything. This is an example of uneconomic activity in the sense that the costs aren't being even paid off by the benefits of, of those activities. Okay? Here's quotes by Richard Miller, a GP geologist, a couple of months ago. New discoveries have not matched consumption since 1986. Better technology raises the amount we can recover, but produc or conventional production is still declining at 4%, some say 6% per year. 37 countries are post-peak oil producing countries. And we need new production equal to a new Saudi Arabia, still the largest, every three or four years just to maintain pace with the decline. So one way or the other, we have to get out of fossil fuels. It may be because we're going to be beaten back by climate change. It may be because we simply can't handle it. Five minutes. Oh, dear. <laughs> A worse taskmaster I've never had. And it's not just fossil fuels. We, the same is true in most other areas of critical minerals essential for the maintenance of industrial society. These, again, are curves uh, produced by one of the largest uh, mining companies on the planet, BHP Billiton. And we see the green representing investment and the yellow and <clears throat> blue bars representing uh, discoveries. And you can see there's been no discoveries in recent uh, time worth talking about. So renewable alternatives are simply not in the card. Any practical substitute for petroleum must be cheap, abundant, increasingly available, transformable into a liquid fuel. Most are not. They produce electricity. Most of our activities don't involve electricity. 
Electricity is 18% of our energy budget. The rest is fossil fuel. Any form of, here's the a kicker, any form of renewable energy must be able to produce itself, in other words, produce all the equipment needed to produce that renewable energy, plus provide the surplus necessary to run society. And when you put it all together today, we've just passed the point where all the renewable energies in the aggregate are barely producing enough energy to produce the equipment they're using to produce that energy. There's no surplus to keep the rest of society going. So in the aggregate, we're not anywhere near the point where we can think of replacing fossil fuel, in which case this may be the future scenario. Not a continuous uh, increase, but in fact a peaking and decline beginning about now. And in fact, the economy is in an undulating plateau, and it's because energy production is in an undulating plateau. And every time the economy starts to tick up, costs go up, or rather energy consumption goes up, so costs go up and suppresses the economy again. We may have seen the end of growth whether we like it or not. So the question is, are we going to go into a planned degrowth or something else? Now, in theory, we can manage this. And I've already mentioned these uh, unique qualities of human beings. High intelligence, the capable of capability to plan ahead, to exercise moral judgment, and so on and so forth. But we're not anywhere near using even ideas that came out 150 years ago with John Stuart Mill, who talked about the stationary state economy. He hoped that we'd reach the point very soon, and this is going back to the middle part of the 19th century, at which no further growth would be necessary because people would have sufficiency to simply enjoy life. What's the point of growing beyond that? He even made an ecological connection. He saw further growth as destroying the a beauty of the planet, the ecological basis of existence. 150 years ago when the economy was a fraction of what it is today, 10% or less, I would imagine. So the problem is that all our contemporary variants, the steady state economy, the degrowth initiative, the kind of language we're using is already 150 years old, and yet it penetrates nowhere into the public policy domain. Why no action? Well, I love this cartoon. Humans are spatial and temporal discounters. Those are my words, but the cartoon is perfect, okay? We favor the here and now over other places and future generations. We're behaviorally conservative. We don't like to change when we're in comfortable positions. There's good neuropsychological and cognitive reasons for this we haven't got time to get into. But worse, this is the new age of unreason. We have entered the endarkenment, a period <laughs> Seriously, of deliberate misinformation to disabuse people of the idea that we have a problem. Hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent, have been spent, and tens of millions more every year to deny climate, to deny evolution, to deny science. Our own government in Ottawa, shutting down libraries, muzzling scientists, firing half the scientific capacities of our major uh, science departments. It's insane that we put up with it. Remember, where's that high intelligence? And yet, well, Vote the buggers in next time if we're not smart. Nobody likes to hear me talk like this. This is another brilliant cartoon. <laughs> Human beings are programmed, programmed to prefer and act upon a reassuring lie rather than to understand the inconvenient truth. I hope much of what I'm talking about is penetrating and I hope it's true. I mean, I may be wrong, but I don't think so, based on the material evidence out there. So we need to act on that. So the bottom line is really quite simple. In coming years, listen to this, in coming years, the human enterprise will likely contract. We're already perhaps in that plateau leading to contraction. But as an intelligent, forward-looking, plan-capable moral species, we can theoretically, understanding something of our own behavior, choose between business as usual, that's what our governments are urging us to do, which would risk, in my view, a chaotic implosion of the economy imposed by nature, dramatic climate change, collapses of ecosystems, which we're seeing one by one, bit by bit around the planet, the cod stocks are just one example, or economic upheaval followed by geopolitical turmoil and resource wars. If we actually run out of fossil fuels and we're in a competitive scramble for the last mineral deposits, China is already embargoing the exports of key industrial minerals. If this reaches a critical point, we will see uh, the, in, the chaotic implosion of global geopolitics 
to the point where any reasonable approach to this problem becomes uh, impossible. The option is degrowth, a well-planned, orderly, cooperative descent toward a socially just sustainability for all. Uh, a recent study, just two weeks ago, was published, uh, partly funded by NASA. It became very controversial. NASA actually had nothing to do with it. They did fund this study, but it's on the collapse and the likelihood of collapse of our current society. They concluded it can be avoided and population can reach equilibrium within the means of nature if the per capita rate of depletion of nature is reduced to a sustainable level and if resources are distributed in a reasonably equitable fashion. That's almost a, a, a mock-up of the definition of degrowth that I talked about right at the outset. So that's the situation as I see it. Thank you very much.